you're ready. You're ready. Come on. Ready to sing loud and sing proud. There you go.
those not some of the fastest moving fingers this side of the Mississippi River or what? So, thank you, band. We appreciate y'all. Nice to be here. Well, welcome to Highlands United Methodist Church here on Town Square. Uh, we have a lot of folks to thank to make this possible. Everybody that showed up early to set up chairs and move them from the old fellowship hall out here and to John Lapoli for allowing us to do this and all the merchants. So uh, we're grateful and grateful that you're here in sunny Highlands. It's a little little hot today, but uh, you guys didn't let that get in your way. I noticed we had like a line of deparkation here for a while until the seats ran out. And so we all filled in. So. No, we're glad you're here as we lead up to Independence Day this week. Uh, we have a lot to be thankful for uh, in our country, for sure. Uh, no matter what division we may have, we have a lot to be thankful for. And it's so great to see everybody come together here. And we're here to worship. Uh, worship the Almighty God that we all serve and who brings peace to our lives. So before we sing, let me just go to the Lord in prayer, uh, if you'll allow me. Almighty and merciful God. We thank you for this rain-free day so far. It can rain later. But uh, we just thank you that we can come together and worship you, making this space possible, the beautiful trees that are protecting us from the sun, protecting my bald head for the moment from the sun. And we give thanks for that. We thank you for this opportunity to have the freedom to worship for what our forefathers gave so many lives for to make it possible. So Lord, we ask for your blessing upon this morning. May you calm our hearts. And let us shake off the ways of the world so that we can worship you uh, in a way that would be pleasing to you. In the holy name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right. And uh, one reminder, if you want to come up and write a prayer concern or a thanksgiving, whatever you may want to do, and put it on the cross while we're singing, and then we'll have another chance to bring it up uh, as well. So you can fill it out and then bring it up a little bit later. So, uh, Lee, Charles, Darren, Layla. Get it started. You can all rise as you're able. We're going to sing America the Beautiful. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountains, majesty. Stand beside her and guide her. 
band, you may be seated. We are going to offer our joys, our birthdays, and anniversaries. And as you know, we don't have a big screen behind us, so we're going to have to take your word for it. <laughs> oh, they're in the program. Okay, does anybody have a birthday? They'd like to raise your hand if you have a birthday this week. Where are they in the program? In the very back? No. Okay, we got birthdays. We got Ryan Bryson. Mike's here to represent him. And uh, Helen McGahee, Warren Leinberger, Amber Porter, Yvonne, you say that word, Janet Avery, and Jessica Carter. So, happy birthday. Is anybody here that has a birthday this week? Because we'd love to sing happy birthday to you. All right, in the back. Okay. We got one lead. Sue, happy What's birthday. Your What's your name? What's your name? We're going to sing right What's name? Sue. 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 All right. It's a special song. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sue. Happy birthday to you. All right. Happy birthday, Sue. Hope it's a great week. Any anniversaries out there? Got one back here. Today, 60, 62 years. 62 years. They can beat that right now. Okay. Any other anniversaries out there this week? Happy anniversary. And Lee has written a special song that he sings like nobody else because he's got trademark rights on it. Lee. Happy anniversary. that anybody wants to stand up and celebrate with us today. I know Christine has one. I'll let her get started. Maybe that'll inspire somebody else. Good morning. Um, my joy this week is this past week, from 8 to 5 every day, we had 12 wonderful elementary children in our first summer camp. Um, we're going to be running two more summer camps, one in July and one in August. Those are full. We have 20 kids coming both of those weeks. But we had 12 kids in and out of the building and all over the community. It was a very joyous. They even got to have lunch with Joy Group. So we were very blessed to be able to join them for that. So that was a great joy in the building this week. Awesome. And thanks for making that possible for our community. Any other joys you'd like to share? Okay. I'm sure a joy for most of you is I look out and I see a lot of faces that aren't necessarily here. But you're here. Either you're visiting or you have a summer home. And your family's in town with you, which is awesome. Because... In Highlands, 4th of July week, I remember people telling me uh, in the shop, they'd come in and say, listen, when our kids got married, we said they can have Christmas and Thanksgiving, but we get you for the 4th of July. So it is a time up here. It's a very special time where families come together and can celebrate not only our freedom, but their time together. So we're grateful for that. Okay. Uh, next is we're going to do our offering. So if I can get a little help uh, from so we can pass the... Bowls here, I'd appreciate it. And play a little opera and music for us there. Thank you. 
so generously this morning. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this church family that you allow us to be a part of. We're thankful for these gifts that have been given this morning and that are given every week and every month throughout the year uh, so that we can bring a ministry to these people so that we can bring you and the life-saving gift of your son, Jesus. So ask for your blessing upon these gifts that uh, we would use them uh, to further you in this kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, now's our time to bring it to the cross. Uh, this is always a very special time in our service. And I think even today when we are celebrating Independence Day in our country this week, is this is our true independence that supersedes everything, is when Jesus made the decision that he would give his life on the cross, the reason his father sent him, but he gave us independence from sin. And so that's more powerful than any freedom you can have because that's your soul. And so this morning, as you bring your prayers up here, I want us to think about that independence that we get from this symbol of the cross that's a symbol to us, but it's where Jesus gave his life. So a little bit of take it to the cross music, guys. allow me a prayer for these concerns and those that are in our hearts and minds. Almighty and merciful God, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for sending your only son to die for our sins so that we can have a relationship with you. So Lord, take away our sin so that we can be with you. Lord, we offer those prayers and we offer the, the many needs around the world. We pray for the people in Ukraine. We pray for peace. We pray for the leaders that can make decisions for peace, that they would... Uh, turn to you and they would feel your power. So Lord, I pray for those that are hurting, whether medical conditions or financial or marital or relationships for families. Lord, may we turn this over to you because we have a lot of different ways that we try to solve our problems, but you are the only way. And I just pray that for these people here today and those that cannot make it or those that may hear us walking down Main Street. Uh, that we love you and we know that we can only find a peace that transcends all understanding and that comes from you. In your holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we got a song down by the riverside. So rise as you are able and the words are in your bulletin and join us. I'm gonna be my love in Jesus. 
Jesus down by the riverside. I'm gonna study for no more. Ain't 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 gonna study. Very meaningful. You may be seated. And uh, before I start the scripture, I, I'm going to make a quick announcement. Lance reminded me is Church in the Wildwood, uh, seven to eight. It's a hymn sing, and uh, from everything I hear, it's wonderful. Just get right out here on Main Street and go 15 minutes. It's on your right. Correct. Okay. All right. Let's go to the, the Word of God, starting in the uh, Gospel of Mark, chapter five, verses 21 through 43. Get comfortable, folks. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jair Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be well and live. So he went with him, and a large crowd gathered, followed him, and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. And for she said, if I touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you? How can you say, Who touched me? He looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing that it happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he entered, he said to them, why do you make such a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside, took the child's father and mother and those who were with him, and went in there where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, I don't know, Tylatham, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. As this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told him to give her something to eat. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Randy? Do you remember that episode in Seinfeld? What it was the, the, the close talker where the guy would get right up to the nose? So good morning. Welcome, Jerry. Thank you for such a good job. A long reading with a little Latin thrown in. So you're welcome, Jerry. Beautifully. Thrilled to have you here uh, today. It's always a special treat for us to be able to worship out in town square, to, to bring our worship service out in the public square. So thank you for being here this morning, and that breeze is welcome. I understand the sun can be a little bit problematic, but we are blessed to be able to gather today. So I want to share with you a little bit. This, this is the Suggested Gospel lesson for today, and I want to just give you just a, a little bit of, of background. In Mark's narrative, in the Gospel narrative, the story of Jesus, before the reading that Jerry shared with us so well this morning, Jesus had been teaching through parables all day. He gets in a boat, and he makes his way across the Sea of Galilee, and a big storm arises. Jesus is sleeping in the stern of the boat. He would have slept through the whole storm had it not been for the disciples waking him up, saying, Master, are you not concerned that we're about to perish and he gets up and he calms the waves and makes the wind stop. Peace 
be still, O oh, you of little faith. You remember that story, many of you know it. It's one of the stories that we shared during Vacation Bible School just a few weeks ago. Christine's already given voice to the summer camp that just wrapped up, and there's two more coming up. And I just, I just want to say a word, if I can, about uh, Christine's leadership, Reverend Christine Murphy. Uh, she is actually, uh, this today, June the 30th, actually is the end of our conference here. Next Sunday is the beginning of another year. So this brings to a close Christine's first year with us as our assistant pastor uh, specializing uh, in children, youth, and family ministry. She certainly has other uh, responsibilities uh, beyond that, but those are her main areas of focus. But she is helping us to become a better church. She is uh, providing wonderful leadership for children and youth and families in this community, and I'm just thrilled with that. And I just want you to take a moment and show your appreciation to Christine. For all her good work. Elizabeth Gordon, who is not here with us today, was the director of our VBS and works very closely with Christine as one of our volunteers, and so we appreciate Elizabeth so much. But again, just grateful for Christine's leadership and what she brings to our staff and to our church and to this community. So Jesus and the disciples get on the other side of the Sea of Galilee to the, uh, to the area called Gerasene, and as soon as he gets off the boat, a man comes wild-eyed and crazy. He's filled with uh, an unclean spirit, and he had been very problematic in the area. He lived among the tombs. Nobody could control him. Nobody could, uh, could, uh, could, could help him in any way. He just was maniacal. He was demonic, if you will. He was just filled with unclean spirits, plural. When Jesus asked the name of the unclean spirit, the unclean spirit said, my name is Legion because they, we are many. And so Jesus cast them out into a herd of swine. If you remember that story, 2,000 swine gives you an idea of how many unclean spirits the man was troubled with. And they went into the water. They all drowned. Word got back from the town. They asked Jesus to leave. Apparently it wasn't good for the farming community, the economy. <laughs> and they were obviously terrified at this power that Jesus had. And so they get back in the boat and they go back across. They were in Gentile territory. Now they go back home to Jewish territory. And that's where our story begins today. And it's actually a story within a story. There are two stories here, two healing stories. Jesus, of course, hears from Jair Jairus that his daughter is uh, deathly ill. He falls down before Jesus, begging him to come and, and help. And so Jesus starts making his way toward Jairus' home so that he can provide some assistance for the little 12-year-old girl who is near death. And while he is going, you heard the story. The lady who has been dealing with hemorrhaging of blood for 12 years. 15th chapter of the book of Leviticus makes it clear that because of that condition, she would have been ritually unclean. She couldn't be out amongst folks. In fact, the, for the unclean, they had to even identify themselves as unclean. She was an outcast. She was ostracized. She was lonely. She was isolated. She had spent all of her money trying to be cured, but had gotten even worse. So she was impoverished. She was sick. She was sickly. She was alone. She did not belong anywhere. And this woman, whose name we do not know. I always find that fascinating. We know Jairus' name. We even know the names of the demons. We don't know her name. It's interesting that we don't know her name uh, in my mind. And I, as I think about that, I think about just human nature. I think about how... How sometimes people who are in her category, people who are unclean, people who are not welcome, people who are pushed away, pushed aside, the outcast, how easy it is for us not to know names. Sometimes we're all good at labeling. In fact, we prefer labeling. Labeling is easier. If I can label somebody, I can categorize them. And if I can categorize them, I can dehumanize them and I can minimize them. I suspect this lady felt dehumanized quite a bit. I suspect she felt minimized quite a bit. I don't know that any of you have felt like that ever in your life. Maybe you've had a moment that was a little bit like that where you didn't quite feel like you belong, like you fit in. I don't know that any of us could really appreciate what this woman has gone through. But here's a woman that we don't know her name. We have an idea of what she has been through. And one thing we know about her is that she is courageous. She had no business being in that crowd. She had no business... 
being with those people that day because in the Leviticus pre-scientific way of understanding, somebody that was rendered ritually unclean was contagious and could make everybody else unclean. She had no business societally being in that crowd, but she had heard about Jesus. And sometimes maybe that's all a person needs is to hear about Jesus, to find some courage. They didn't know that they had, so she makes her way, pushes her way. We all get the idea through the crowd. She touches the, the cloak, believing that if she could just make some kind of contact with Jesus, she would be healed. And there's that wonderful moment. She grabs it. She is healed. Jesus knows the power has gone from him. He turns around. Who touched me? The crowd, the disciples think, who, what do you mean who touched you? Everybody's touching you. But Jesus and the woman knew something that nobody else knew. That there had been a healing that moment. A healing in that second. And that woman had experienced it. It's a beautiful story. It's a, it's a story of healing. It's a story of faith. It's a story that Mark uses to point us once again to this Jesus. This Jesus who can calm the storm in the midst of the Sea of Galilee that's brewing, this Jesus who can call out the legion of unclean spirits, this Jesus now who has been touched by this unclean woman and is healed. So the rest of the story picks up, the story that started. Jesus keeps going and he goes to Jairus' house and you heard the story. The little girl by this time is dead. Jesus reaches and touches her hand. Which, of course, again, by the book of Leviticus, makes Jesus now unclean because anybody who touches any dead thing, which is unclean, the dead are unclean in the Leviticus way of understanding. And if you touch an unclean thing, you yourself become unclean. So here is Jesus, once again, the second time in this text, he has been touched by the unclean. This time he initiates the contact, reaches out to the young lady and says, what was it he said, Jerry? He says that word, <laughs> which means little girl, get up. And she gets up. She's healed. It's a wonderful story. Again, in this series of stories about Jesus, Mark wants us to know something about Jesus. He commands even the waves and the wind. He commands the unclean spirits. He has the power to bring life out of death and to bring healing. This is the Jesus Mark wants us to meet in this text. Now, I always feel like I need to be a little careful when I preach about healing stories in the Bible. Because I, I've seen some bad theology around that, in my estimation. Because I know, and you know as well as I do, that not everybody gets healed. I know as well as you know that there have been plenty of people we've prayed for who died anyway. And so I want to be real careful around these kinds of stories because I don't want to communicate to you. I wouldn't want you leaving here believing that, oh, if I just had a little more faith, my friend would have been healed. Oh, if I just had a little more faith, my loved one would not have died. Because sometimes people can have that level of guilt. And sometimes well-meaning religious folk can burden people with, again, what I would say is some harmful and bad theologies. I don't know how healing works. I don't know why some people are healed and some people are not, but what I, what I do know is that in this story, in these stories, in this gospel narrative, Mark is wanting us to point our direction and our focus at the one who has the power to do all these things, the one who brings hope out of despair, the one who can be with us in the midst of our storms, the one who does not turn away from the unclean and the outcast, the one who welcomes all. You know, I, I mentioned the lady in the middle of the story didn't have a name. She didn't have a name. But one thing I failed to mention to you, and let me just kind of backtrack very quickly because I think it's an important part of the story. Maybe you caught it when Jerry read, when Jesus said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. You know, it's the only time in the Gospels that Jesus identifies an individual, a woman, a single person by the name daughter. It's the only time in the Gospels Jesus calls a woman daughter. He mentions a group of women, daughters of Zion, I think in Luke's Gospel. But this is the only time he addresses a single individual woman as daughter. And I love that about this 
story because it says to me, in the way I do my kingdom math, if she is Jesus' daughter, that makes her our sister. As I continue to apply my kingdom math, that means that all who are outcast, all who feel unclean, all who feel unwelcome, I think she represents them all, are all our sisters and brothers. Amen. I think that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I think that's what Jesus calls us to do. I think that's who Jesus calls us to be. There are connecting points with this story that are interesting. Jesus calls the woman daughter. It's Jer uh, Jairus' daughter that is healed. Uh, the woman had been dealing with the issue of blood for 12 years. Jairus' daughter is 12 years old. I, I don't know if Mark is using the 12 number symbolically. It does have some biblical significance. Just earlier, a couple of chapters earlier, the third chapter of Mark, Jesus calls his disciples and he names them and commissions them. You remember how many disciples there are? Twelve disciples. In the Bible, twelve oftentimes represents the people of God. If you get to the book of Revelation and in the apocalyptic writings, you will see twelve being applied many times, usually meaning the people of God. I wonder, I just wonder, I don't know how Mark's mind worked, but I can't help but wonder if one of the reasons why we have 12 twice in this story is that Mark wants us to know that Jesus, that he is talking about the people of God when he talks about the two unclean individuals, the woman and the child, both unclean by their conditions, both people of God. So what are we to take from the story? I think simply there are many things we could take from this story. There's more than one way to interpret a biblical text. There's more than one interpretation that can come from any particular biblical passage. Not, there's not just one meaning that's limited. But I think what I would just invite us to hear as we prepare to close our service here in Town Square this morning is that Jesus loves everybody. That means me and you, and I say thanks be to God for that. That means people that look like us, people who don't look like us, people who are like us, people who are not like us. I think Jesus is not afraid to touch the untouchable, not afraid to welcome the unclean, not afraid to enter into the pain and suffering of others. And I think the Gospel of Mark makes it clear, and this is what I simply leave you with today. I don't know what's going on in your life. You look great, by the way. You look fantastic. As far as I know, life is good. You don't have a care in the world. You're just as happy as you can be. But I know, I just know, that sometimes the hurts that are the deepest are the ones that don't show. I understand that too. So I simply have come today, beloved, to bring you good news. You're all welcome at the table. And that is good news. And I've simply come once again to point you to the one who can calm the storms, the one who is present in the storms. I simply come to you today to point you to the one who is not he is not reluctant to reach out to the depths of our hurts and our pains. I've simply come to once again point you to the one who has the power to bring life out of death and to bring new life and to hope out of despair. I've simply come, friends, once again today, today in Town Square in Highlands, North Carolina, once again to point you to Jesus. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our final song is... Too. What a friend we have in Jesus. What an appropriate song. I invite you to stand as you're able.
Fourth of July week, and you prepare to do some barbecuing, maybe having a cold drink. Just remember, we are <coughs> celebrating two freedoms as Christians. One is the freedom that those that fought from British rule to give us the freedom to worship as we choose, uh, to whom we choose. But we choose the God of Jesus here today, and but the God of Jesus is the one who really sets you free. So Amen. enjoy that and may God's blessing be upon you and the band will now fly us away.